Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to In User Education. Um, we continue talking about uh, phenomena of light, and uh, this lecture is about interference between different rays of light. <coughs> now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unisor.com. If you found this lecture on YouTube or on any other source, I do suggest you to um, to go to Unisor.com and uh, through the corresponding menu go to this lecture and um, watch it from there and simultaneously you have notes for the lecture. And notes are actual like, like a textbook. So um, the advantage of uh, watching it on Unisor.com is number one, every lecture has uh, its notes. Uh, number two, all lectures are organized in menus, basically. So there is a course called Physics 14. It's divided into into parts. Now this part is waves, and uh, parts are divided into uh, topics. Like in this case, it's phenomena of light, and the topic contain topic contains certain lectures. All these phenomena which we are talking about, each one is a lecture. So there is a logical dependence between uh, parts of the course, and uh, it's very important to basically go and study in, in certain sequence. Um, another advantage of the website is that there are exams. Now, exams are a separate issue, and they're not presented anywhere but on the website, and I do suggest you to take these exams. You can take them as many times as you want. You will get your score and you can repeat it uh, again and again. If your score is not complete, you go back into the course, you learn a little bit more, you take exam again, and that would ass assure that you know the educational material presented in the course. And um, the last but not least, the website is totally free. Uh, there are no strings attached, no advertising, no advertising, because advertising really um, prevents you from getting deep into the course. So no advertising, um, and even signing in is uh, is optional. I mean, if you want, you can sign in, you can establish an account, but again, there is no requirements of this. The signing in is necessary for supervised studying. So if you would like to supervise or you're a student and you want to be supervised by somebody else, then both supervisor or a parent actually and the student should register and they should establish the connection uh, using, using the signing in. And then the supervisor can actually do some kind of control over the educational process. Okay, back to light. And what's really um, important, I think, is to understand the wave theory, um, classical wave theory, in, in more details. And for this reason, I think I would prefer to talk about waves on the water and interference of waves on the water before we talk about interference of light um, I I uh, light rays. Um, now, why? Well, because it's visible. You know, this kind of thing, it, it's better to, to be able to touch it. So, the waves on the water surface are more well, mechanical, and you can see every wave actually with your eyes. You can touch it. So, I think it's better to talk about the water waves first and about interference. Because with light, it's, it's exactly the same thing. So let me start with the water, and we will introduce certain concepts, etc. So, interference starts when we have more than one source of oscillations. Now, let's start with one source of oscillation. You have, let's say, you are touching the water with certain um, periodicity. And let's say, your periodicity is um, always maintained and the interval between touching and uh, I know, the force you're touching is exactly the same. So what's happening is you will have 
concentric waves going from the point you're touching to all the different sides. So let's imagine that the water uh, is um, a, an XY plane, coordinate plane. The surface of water, horizontal surface, is XY plane. And the Z goes perpendicularly. Now, every point on the surface of water has its X and Z, uh, sorry, X and Y coordinates. Okay? So this is the point, if you will look at this from the top. Now, so the, the waves, as they are actually occurring on the water, we kind of think about this, that every molecule goes up and down, up and down. And every molecule, when it goes up, then the next one, with a certain delay of time, goes uh, immediately after it, and then another one, and that's how the wave actually is propagating. So, every molecule has X and Y coordinates fixed, because it goes up and down, and only Z coordinate is uh, changing. Well, that's not exactly correct. As a matter of fact, the movement is not exactly up and down, because if one is up and another is down, the difference, um, the distance between these molecules would be greater than when, I, when they are um, on the horizontal level. So you cannot go this and this without basically like stretching something. So the movement is not exactly up and down, it's more like a ellipsoidal kind of thing. But again, we are in physics, and in physics everything is approximate, and approximately we imagine that every molecule goes up and down. Now, how can we describe this movement? Well, because it's an up and down periodic movement, um, it, it reaches the maximum, then goes down uh, faster and faster, goes through the zero level and then goes down, uh, uh, slowing down, so it's basically very nicely um, described as a trigonometric function, sine or cosine. So traditionally, we use cosine of what? OK, now, this is important. First of all, um, it obviously depends on time. So there is a periodicity, right? So I'm touching the water with certain periodicity. Now, what can we say about the periodicity? Well, there is a time interval between my touching the water, right? So T is time period. Also, you can measure it with the frequency, number of touching the water and corresponding the number of ways, w waves which are passing any particular point per unit of time. So this is frequency. Okay, what else? Well, since we are talking about cosine, and obviously as the time goes by, any particular molecule goes up and down, up and down, exactly like the cosine of some argument. Now, what is the argument? Well, the argument usually is represented as omega times t. Well, the t is time, that's obviously. Now, what is omega? Well, omega is actually very much related to this particular frequency. Let's think about it. If I have certain number of um, oscillations per second. Now, if I'm talking about cosine, it means that cosine goes up and down, which means it reaches the point where the cosine is equal to 1, and then it goes down minus 1. And from, let's say, from 0 to 1 to minus 1 to 0 is a period. Now, the period of a cosine is 2 pi. So, as this thing is occurring certain number of times per second. This thing also omega times t. So the obvious relationship would be omega is equal to 2 pi f. Why? Well, let's consider we have f is equal to 1. We are touching once per second. 
well, that means that omega would be equal to only 2 pi. And now the t. If t is equal to 0, cosine is equal to 0, and this t is equal to 1, cosine was e is equal to, 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 to 1. Uh, to 0, it's cosine is, is 1, right, cosine of 0. Then this t equals to 1, it would be 2 pi. Again, cosine would, would, would be equal to 1. So the distance between maximums of cosine would be exactly as it's supposed to be. It will be 1 per second. So that's very convenient um, angular representation of frequency. So omega is called angular frequency. So we have omega. Angular frequency. Okay. So we have period, we have frequency, we have the wavelengths. Okay. Um, we have angular frequency, right? Now, um, if I will close the parenthesis here, would that be correct? Well, it depends. Look, if at certain point, at point x, y, at certain time, cosine is equal to 1. If I will close this parenthesis. Let's say again, let's say f is equal to 1, which means once, once per second. So this is equal to 2 pi. So I will have every second I will be on the 1. But if my point x, y is further from the source, then it's not on every second it will be on, it will be on every second plus let's say one hundredth of a second or maybe on every second plus half a second or something so it depends on the distance right so there is always something which we call a phase shift phase shift is basically an angle we have to add to this one which depends on the uh, distance r where r square is equal to x square plus y square so it depends on the distance from the source if the distance is um, equal number not equal integer number of the waves then it will be exactly the same as in the very beginning so let's say in the very beginning uh, our water is at flat level at zero and then at, at moment t is equal to zero and we touch it at this moment so the t equals to zero equals to basically zero deviation from the level and then the wave goes now if if my integer number of waves This is the one wave. So if integer number of waves fills the distance from source to my point uh, on the water, then this phase would be exactly the same as this one. Right? If this is zero, this would be zero. Now, but if this is slightly off, well, it will be, it will end like this on the flat and then it will go up or down or whatever so I will not be exactly on the same level as this one so there is always certain phase shift which depends on what well it depends on this distance and how many waves are in it so every wave gives you basically a 2 pi um, shift one wave angular frequency is uh, uh, omega so it would be 2 pi so how many of these waves actually fit to this well it depends on the distance so if lambda is the wavelength which means distance between this let's say uh, crest and and this crest or between this zero and this zero that's the same thing so that's the wavelengths 
So how many wavelengths fit into this? Well, you have to divide R by lambda. And every wave... Now, that's not necessarily an integer number, right? So every wave gives you 2 pi offset in angular uh, displacement. So this would be a total displacement relative to the beginning of this. So instead of phi of r, you can say 2 pi r divided by lambda. R is a distance, lambda is one wavelength, so R over lambda gives you how many waves, and every wave is basically, in angular uh, notation, would be a 2 pi. Okay, there is one more detail. It depends on when I started. If I started, let's say, at level 0, I start at t is equal to 0. But it depends actually on, on, on how I basically where exactly I start my timing. I can start timing when my water is already, let's say, in the upper position or the bottom position, on the crest or on the, uh, how is it called, trough, trough, whatever. So there is always something like phi zero, which is initial phase of this. In most cases, we decide it's zero, but it depends on how we start timing, basically. But in any case, this is the relatively complete formula, again, on the physical level of precision, let's say, because again, cosine is approximation, uh, and uh, periodicity is not an approximation, but it's always um, approximate, obviously, because you cannot exactly... Uh, but again, physics is all about approximation, the proper approximation. So this formula well describes the Z component, the how much up and down, a molecule goes. Now we are talking about so far only on uh, uh, with a, um, a case with uh, only one particular um, source of oscillations. Okay. Uh, what else did I actually? Oh yes, how um, how uh, lambda related to to frequency? Well, let's think about this way. If lambda is the wavelength and t period is the time it takes from one crest to another, so lambda is the distance between the two crests or two troughs or two zero points, doesn't matter. So if lambda is the distance and t is the time, then lambda divided by t is speed, right? The water has certain speed of propagating, and it's not dependent actually on the frequency, because no matter how frequently you beat the water, the waves will go with its own speed, whatever the water properties actually are. So the waves will be shorter if you uh, hit the water more frequently, or longer, but it's still the same speed of propagation. So V is like a constant. For a water, it's a constant. So that's how they are related. So you can always say that since 1 over t, yes, um, 1 over t, what is 1 over t? That's the frequency, right? How many times? If t is the time it takes for one um, wave, and you have f, waves per second, then obviously 1 over t would be f. So you can always say that lambda kind t times f is v. And since frequency can be expressed uh, with angular frequency, you can replace it here, so it would be lambda times omega divided by 2 pi is equal to v, or whatever else, like lambda is equal to 2 pi v divided by omega, etc. Now, all these formulas, I never remember them. And again, I suggest you to just think about these formulas, logically think about Let me just remind you again. Now, this is kind of obvious, because lambda is length uh, from one, let's say, crest to another crest. 
and t is the time the water passes one point, which means what does it mean pa passes? It means when the point is in the top position, when the water goes, the wave goes, and then the next wave, ne next wave comes, until the time the next one. So that's exactly the time between two crests. So if you divide, that would be speed. That's that's one thing which which sh should be remembered. Now what's this? F is number of uh, number of times the wave passes, number of waves per 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 second, and every wave is two pi angular, right? Because the up and down, up and down, so the full cycle, we are all kind of gearing towards trigonometry here, so that's why if f is number of um, waves per second, then 2 pi times f would be um, the, the, the angular uh, number, of, uh, number of radians, if you wish, uh, per second. Uh, what else? Well, r is obviously, that's Pythagorean theorem, and uh, well, that, that's it. I mean, all these formulas are logical. You do not have to remember them. All you do have to remember is there is a frequency and there is an angular frequency, just the concepts. There is a speed of propagation and there is a wavelength between two crests or two troughs. Um, okay, so now we have finished with one particular um, source of oscillations. Now let's think about interference, the, the purpose of this lecture. Well, the purpose of this, le this lecture is when you have two sources and also waves here. So what happens in this particular case? Well, let's think about one particular molecule. Now, for simplicity, oh, I didn't really add one more thing. In this particular case, it all depends al also on the amplitude, because it depends on how strongly we hit the water, right? So the stronger, the bigger waves will, will be. So this is basically an amplitude. Okay, now let's talk about this particular point on the surface of water. Now, it actually is under influence of both waves propagating into this point from here and from there. So every, every molecule of water will participate in, in both of them. So, if you have a point M and N, you have something which is ZM of T, and you have ZN of T. So what happens if only one source would be, that's this function, and what happens with this molecule if only this function? So if you will summarize them together, that's how you, that, that, that's how you define the result. That's, that's what result will be. It's like two forces actually um, acting on, on, on the same object. They are adding by vector uh, addition. In this case, the waves are addition by basically using a uh, regular addition sign. So you have to add this one for M and this one for N. Now, for simplicity, it's usually assumed that the difference between these functions is only in distance. So we are assuming that these are synchronous uh, oscillations of the source, which gives you exactly the same period, exactly the same frequency, obviously exactly the same angular frequency, the same amplitude, and the only difference is the difference between Rm and Rn. So, and the phase is also the same because they are synchronous. So, the only difference is in this component. So, what happens in this particular case? Let's just think logically. I mean, yes, obviously we can add one to another and we will get whatever the formula is, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to understand what happens. If 
at this point, this particular wave comes at the crest. And this wave also comes at a crest. What happens? Well, two crests will increase each other, and that would be a higher crest. So, if the waves are coming in the same phase, they will increase each other. So, both will be um, at the same time on the bottom, on the trough, and that would be even bigger uh, uh, trough. Or both will be on the crest, it will be bigger crest. Or both will be at zero, and the result will be zero. So, what I'm saying is that if two waves are coming at the same phase in this point, then at this point the oscillations would be well, bigger than each one of them. Now, that's called in-phase. If these two waves are coming, let's say, in opposite phase, which means whenever this goes all the way up to A, this goes by itself, would go to all the way down to minus A. And what happens in this particular case? Well, they will nullify each other. So, there are some points on the surface of the water which will be oscillating up and down greater than from one source. There are points which will be almost no oscillations at all uh, if, uh, if, if you have both sources, because they would nullify each other. So that's exactly the picture which you will get on the surface of water. Instead of waves synchronously expanding and expanding as with one particular source, you will have some kind of a relatively chaotic picture of some pieces on the water are really uh, oscillating up and down significantly, and other not at all. Well, obviously there are some in-between in cases when this comes, let's say, at a crest, and this one becomes at half a crest. Well, then the corresponding arithmetic would, uh, would work out. So it all, uh, everything in, in, in between will basically oscillate in between, not as high as when both waves are uh, in, in sync, in, in, in phase, and uh, higher than if they are in uh, opposite phases. Opposite phase is sometimes called antiphase. So there is in phase and in antiphase. And everything else is in between. Now, is that everything I wanted? Yes, one little thing. So how can I basically know whether they are in phase or not in phase? Well, very simply. Let's talk about this. Delta is equal to Rm minus Rn. The difference between them. If the difference between them is integer times length, the wavelengths, n is integer, if n is integer, and the difference between the distances is integer number of waves, both have the same lambda, we have agreed that these are exactly the same kind of oscillation, just in different places. So the lambda, it, lambda is the same, wavelength is the same, so they are coming both either uh, in uh, on the crest, or both on the trough, or both on the zero, whatever it is, but they are always enhancing each other. So this is in phase. If, however, is equal to n plus zero point five times lambda. <coughs> which means certain number of um, full waves plus half a wave. Well, that actually, what this half makes it opposite, right? So if one is in this particular case, another is in this particular case, and when we will add them together, they will nullify each other. That's what means, because if you will shift it by half, 
it will be exactly the same as here, right? This is half a wavelength shift. So this is condition of in empty phase. So and everything in between obviously would be in between. So there are points where waves enhance each other and that would be a, a larger deviation from zero level from xy plane when the water is still and this would be a condition when the waves would nullify each other which means that the water will be still at this point because the, the, the waves will completely nullify each other if you will add this to this you will have zero and that's my end of the water thing now let's talk about life so basically, what I would like to say is that there is absolutely nothing new I can tell you about the light. But I just wanted to use the water as kind of a more tangible example of this. So what can we do about light? And we can actually try to simulate this type of situation. Well, let's do it this way. Let's say we have um, flat wave, le uh, wave front of monochromatic um, light. Now, why is monochromatic? Well, you remember that the color is related to the wavelengths. Since we are talking about this example of interference, on the water with two different um, oscillators uh, of the same frequency, of, of, the, of the same wavelength, etc. So everything is exactly the same. Now the, uh, the white light is the combination of different frequencies, different of wavelengths, right? So uh, we are not talking about white light right now. White light is much more complex situation. Let's talk about monochromatic. So let's say it's a red light or whatever, whatever the color, whatever your favorite color is. Okay. Now, let's say we have some kind of a wall here with two uh, small slots. Well, as we have a synchronous rays of light, which are coming into two um, slots, Slits, I would pro sh pro probably should say slit, um, because um, it, it's like a wall. We are, we are looking from the top, and this is the wall, and there is a vertical slit on it, okay? So this is the screen. So what kind of a picture we will have here? So we will have uh, two, basically, sources of light, uh, according to the Huygens, principle whenever we reach with my uh, uh, with our waterfront certain point this certain point can be considered as a source of um, um, additional light if you wish and that's how the light is propagating so uh, every slit has basically been a source of light and these two are in complete sync because they are coming from the same flat um, wave front of light so basically from this we will have light going this way and in a way it's similar to whatever we whatever we saw on the surface of water where we had two oscillators oscillating was exactly the same frequency synchronously etc. That's exactly how we build this model with light. So what shall we see here? Well, first of all, we will not see oscillations like we saw it on the water, right? Because on the water we really see how the molecules are moving up and down. Here we don't really see it, so what exactly will we see? Here it is. Every point here has certain distance from this and from this. So if this is M, this is N, 
So this point has Rm and Rn. Now, if this delta is equal to n times lambda, exactly the same as for the water, where lambda is the wavelengths of this favorite color of light you have, let's say it's red, what happens then? Well, then the waves from this guy and the waves from this guy will enhance each other. Which means, um, how should I say it, per unit of length of this screen, we will have more light energy coming into it. Now, we don't see the oscillations of light. What we see is um, a brighter spot because more energy uh, are coming into this particular spot and it actually is viewed by our eye. Now our eye has certain nerves, etc. How do we see it, basically? We see it as a bright uh, spot. Now, if this delta is equal to n plus 0 0.5 lambda, the waves will nullify each other and we will see it as a dark spot. So, my point is that the picture on the screen would be basically uh, spots of different brightness. Or it's not really spots because it gradually uh, comes from one to another. Now, the brightest spot will be in the middle because the distances are the same, right? Distances are the same, so the difference is zero, so it's definitely in sync, in phase and that would be the brightest spot. Now, if brightness I will display as, as, as a curve, then it will be brighter here and then diminishing, and at some point it will be almost zero, then there will be more and more and more here, and more and more waves here. So this is, this is a graph of brightness of whatever picture we have on the, um, uh, on the screen. Now, you can, you can always go to internet and search for interference of light and um, uh, look at images which it will display you. It will actually be exactly the picture like this, of different brightness. So, if these are slits, then this will be uh, the lines, brighter lines. We are, we are looking from the top, it's a section, right? So, that will be brighter lines and darker lines. And the brightest would be in the middle, and then the brightness would be diminishing. And why the brightness is diminishing? Well, obviously, because the angle is more and more... Um, uh, um, the incident angle, if you would take this point, for instance, obviously, per unit of, uh, uh, of the unit of length on the screen, the amount of energy would be uh, obviously less because we are at um, greater and greater incident angle. The, the farther it is, the less um, energy would, feel, uh, would fall, and that's why you will have these bright um, spots really diminishing of the brightness. Okay, so that's the main thing I wanted to talk about. So it all depends on this. Now, how about some formulas? Well, we are still kind of uh, approaching physics from a, a little bit of mathematics here. So there is some very little amount of mathematics here. How can I find out where exactly are the bright spots and where are the dark spots? So let's have, let's have this is as zero and this is an x. So let's say my point is at x. Now, what can I um, uh, say about this particular um, brightness level? Well, let's find out what is the difference between the distances, right? So the distance Rm, Rm, so let's say this is L, 
this is D between the slits, and this is X. Um, okay, I think it's a very bad picture. Let me just do it better. So we have two slits at distance D. I have this distance L, and this is X. So what is this? Well, um, this is D over 2, and this is D over 2, right? It's the middle point between two slits. <coughs> so this is L, this is M, N. So Rm is equal to square root of L squared plus x plus d over 2 square. That's the Pythagorean theorem, right? x plus d over 2. Our n is equal to square root of L square plus x minus d over 2 square. Okay? <coughs> okay. That's it. Now, what is the difference between them? Rm minus Rn is equal to... Well, that would be one square root minus another square root, right? Now, how can I simplify it? Well, it's equal to one square root minus another square root. I will multiply it by some of these square roots. Okay? Now, minus and plus would be square of this and minus square of that, right? A minus B times A plus B, it's A square minus B square. So square of this would be whatever is under this, root, uh, uh, under this square root. And square of this would be whatever uh, 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 under this root. And if I will subtract them, so what will be remaining? L square would be nullified, X square would be nullified, d square over 4 would be nullified, and the only thing which would remain is uh, 2 times x times d over 2, which is xd, um, and then plus another xd, so it would be 2xd, right? So what will be on the bottom? Sum of these two. Here we go to uh, physicists' level of precision. What they're saying is, that this is approximately sum of these is approximately this is a little bit more and this is a little bit less so if l is relatively big relative to x and t then it's approximately 2 square root of l square plus x square so i will just diminish slightly this one increase slightly this one Obviously, if x and d are really small, and l is really large, then it's, it's a decent approximation. So that's what they're using. This is also cancelling. <coughs> and what remains is this. better put it differently, better put it this way, this is my mistake, like this. Now what is this? Well, L, X, <coughs> well this is if this is an angle theta, it's approximately d times sine of theta. And again, it depends what exactly is theta. In this particular case, I'm talking about the ray which goes from the middle between the two slits to this point of interest. Again, it all depends on how small are these x and d relatively to L. So, but in any case, this is what we have. X is cathetus, uh, sorry, cosine. 
No, sine. No, okay. That's not a theta, I'm sorry. Theta, we are talking about incident angle, right? Theta. So it's in the incident angle, it's angle with uh, perpendicular. So this theta and this is theta. Okay, sorry. So if we divide this to this, we will have sine. So this is basically the um, condition on having a bright or light uh, line on the screen. If this is equal, uh, sorry, equal uh, integer number of uh, wavelengths, so this is Rm minus Rn, right? So, by the way, it doesn't depend on L. So, it all depends on the incident angle into point of interest. So, if this um, quantity is integer number of uh, wavelengths of light, of red light, or whatever your monochromatic light here. Light here. Then we will have a, a, a bright line at that point. If this is n plus half of the wavelengths, then we will have a dark spot, and everything in between will be correspondingly less bright or greater, etc. Okay, and very small note to this. How many bright lines we will have? <coughs> so, bright line is n times lambda is equal to d times sine theta, right? Lambda is a wavelength, n is some kind of a number. So, what? how big number n can be? Well, obviously, if n is equal to zero, we will have the perpendicular here. Sine would be equal to zero, so that would be 90 degree um, incident angle. Now, as n is increasing, we have certain limit, right? Sine cannot be greater than one, so n times lambda should always be less than equal to d, actually even less, which means number of lines should be less than d divided by lambda. That's a very interesting formula. So if we know the distance between the slits and the wavelengths of the color, whatever, of the light which comes down, we can calculate how many maximum number of lines we can see. And that's the end of this lecture. <laughs> it's a little longer, but in any case, I think what's important is to um, basically uh, having in mind that it all depends on whether the two rays of light are coming in phase or, well, not in phase, maybe in anti-phase something like this. And that's the reason for having bright and dark um, uh, uh, lines of light on the screen. And the number of lines is restricted basically by, the, by this very interesting ratio. Uh, distance between the... Um, well, if this distance is significant, I mean, let's say, I don't know, a centimeter, right? It's a significant relative to the length of uh, wavelengths of the light, and that's why you will have a very big, big number of lines, but you will not see them, basically, uh, all, all of them, obviously, because the intensity is definitely diminishing. It's like the sun, when sun goes down perpendicular to the Earth, you feel the heat. If sun is above the horizon at the angle, it's much less energy falls on the unit of square foot or square meter or whatever. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> and I do suggest you to um, read the notes for this lecture. There is a nicer picture over there. And again, there are formulas, etc. It will give you another look at this material. Thank you very much and good luck. <coughs>